Hello there, guys. My name is Mikey. We are live on twitch.tv forward slash Mikey Mega Mega, and we're going to be reading one of my favorite sci fi books of all time Dune. It is an absolutely fantastic thing. Uh, we're just going to test our way through the chapters. Uh, let me know what you think. And uh, hopefully you can also see this live on YouTube where I'll put it all in a lovely playlist. There'll be a thing somewhere on screen where you can kind of catch all of these chapters together. And uh, yeah, should we just dive straight in? By the way, this book is normal sized. I'm just very, very petite. Lovely to have you. The Great Dune Trilogy. <clears throat> Dune. A beginning is a time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. This every sister of the Bene Gesserit knows. To begin your study of the life of Muad'Dib, then, take care that you first place him in his time. Born in the fifty-seventh year of the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV, and take most special care that you locate Muad'Dib in his place, the planet Arrakis. Do not be deceived by the fact he was born on Caladan and lived his first fifteen years there. Arrakis, the planet known as Dune, is forever his place. From the Manual of Muad'Dib by Princess Iwulan. In the week before their departure to Arrakis, when all the final scurrying about had reached a nearly unbearable frenzy, an old crone came to visit the mother of the boy, Paul. It was a warm night at Castle Caladan, and the ancient pile of stone that had served the Atreides family as home for twenty-six generations bore that cooled sweat feeling it acquired before a change in the weather. The old woman was let in by the side door down a vaulted passage by Paul's room, and she was allowed a moment to peer in at him where he lay in his bed. By the half-light of the suspenser lamp, dimmed and hanging near the floor, the awakened boy could see a bulky female shape at his door, standing one step ahead of his mother. The old woman was a witch shadow, hair like matted spiderwebs, hooded around darkness of features, eyes like glittering jewels. Is he not small for his age, Jessica? The old woman asked. Her voice wheezed and twanged like an untuned ballyset. Paul's mother answered in her soft contralto. The Atreides are known to start late getting their growth, your revenants. So I've heard, so I've heard, wheezed the old woman. Yet he is already fifteen. Yes, your revenants. He's awake and listening to us, said the old woman. Sly little rascal, she chuckled. But royalty has need of slyness. And if he's really the Kwisatz Haderach, well... Within the shadows of his bed, Paul held his eyes open to mere slits. Two bird-bright ovals, the eyes of the old woman seemed to expand and glow as they stared into his. "'Sleep well, you sly little rascal,' said the old woman. "'Tomorrow you'll need all your faculties to meet my Gom Jabbar.' And she was gone, pushing his mother out, closing the door with a solid thump. Paul lay awake, wondering, "'What's a Gom Jabbar?' In all the upset during this time of change, the old woman was the strangest thing he had seen. Your revenance. And the way he called his mother Jessica like a common servant wench, instead of what she was, a Bene Gesserit lady, a duke's concubine, and mother of the ducal heir. Is a Gomjabar something of a rackus? I must know before we go there, he wondered. He mouthed her strange words. Gom Jabbar, Kwisatz Adarak. There had been so many things to learn. Arrakis would be a place so different from Caladan that Paul's mind whirled with the new knowledge. Arrakis, Dune, Desert Planet. Furfihuat, 
his father's master of assassins had explained it. Their mortal enemies, the Harkonnens, had been on Arrakis 80 years, holding the planet in quasi fife under a Chome Company contract to mine the geriatric spice melange. Now the Harkonnens were leaving, to be replaced by the House Atreides and Fife Complete. An apparent victory for the Duke Leto, yet Hoat had said this appearance contained the deadliest peril for the Duke Leto was popular among the great houses of the Landstrad. A popular man arouses the jealousy of a powerful, Hoat had said. Arrakis, Dune, Desert Planet. Paul fell asleep to a dream of an Arakeen cavern, silent people all around him moving in the dim light of glow globes. It was a solemn affair, and like a cathedral he listened to a faint sound, the drip, drip, drip of water. Even while he remained in the dream, Paul knew he would remember it upon awakening. He always remembered the dreams that were predictions. The dream faded. Paul awoke to feel himself in the warmth of his bed, thinking, thinking. This world of Castle Caladan, without play or companions his own age, perhaps did not deserve sadness in farewell. Dr. Yue, his teacher, had hinted that the Farfaluch's class system was not rigidly guarded on Arrakis. The planet sheltered people who lived at the desert edge without Cade or Bashar to command them. Will of the Sand People, called Fremen, marked down on no census of the Imperial Regate. Arrakis, Dune, Desert Planet. Paul sensed his own tensions decided to practice one of the mind-body lessons his mother had taught him. Three quick breaths triggered the responses. He fell into the floating awareness, focusing the consciousness, the autodilation, dilation avoiding the unfocused mechanism of the consciousness. To be conscious by choice, blood enriched and swift flooding the overload regions. One does not obtain food, safety, freedom by instinct alone. Animal consciousness does not extend beyond the given moment, nor into the idea that its victims may become extinct. The animal destroys and does not reproduce. Animal pleasures remain close to the sensation levels and avoid the perceptual. The human requires a background grid through which to see his universe. Focus consciousness by choice. This forms your grid. Bodily integrity follows nerve blood flow according to the deepest awareness of cell needs. All things, cells, beings are impermanent. Strive for flow permanence within. Over and over and over within Paul's floating awareness the lesson rolled. When dawn touched Paul's window still with yellow light, he sensed it through closed eyelids, opened them hearing then the renewed bustle and hurry in the castle, and seeing the familiar patterned beams of his bedroom ceiling. The hall door opened and his mother peered in, hair like shaded bronze held with a black ribbon at the crown, her oval face emotionless and green eyes staring solemnly. "'You're awake,' she said. "'Did you sleep well?' "'Yes.' He studied the tallness of her, saw the hint of tension in her shoulders as she chose clothing for him from the closet racks. Another might have missed the tension, but she had trained him in the Bene Gesserit way, in the minutia of observation. She turned, holding a semi-formal jacket for him. It carried the red Atreides hawk crest above the breast pocket. Hurry and dress, she said. Reverend Mother is waiting. I dreamed of her once, Paul said. Who is she? She was my teacher at the Bene Gesserit School. Now she's the Emperor's truth sayer. And Paul? She hesitated. You must tell her about your dreams. I will. Is she the reason we got Arrakis? We did not get 
Arrakis. Jessica flicked dust from a pair of trousers, hung them with the jacket on the dressing stand beside his bed. Don't keep the Reverend Mother waiting. Paul sat up, hugged his knees. What's a Gomjabar? Again, the training she had given him exposed her almost invisible hesitation, a nervous betrayal he felt as fear. Jessica crossed to the window, flung wide the draperies, and stared across the river orchards towards Mount Sayubi. You'll learn about the Gomjabar soon enough, she said. He heard the fear in her voice and wondered at it. Jessica spoke without turning. Reverend Mother is waiting in my morning room. Please hurry. The Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen Moorheem, sat in a tapestried chair watching Mother and Son approach. Windows on each side of her overlooked the curving southern bend of the river and the green farmlands of the Atreides family holding. But the Reverend Mother ignored the view. She was feeling her age this morning, more than a little petulant, and she blamed it on the space travel and the association with the abominable spacing guild and its secretive ways. But here was a mission that required personal attention from a Bene Gesserit with the sight. Even the Padishah Emperor's truthsayer couldn't evade that responsibility when the duty call came. Damn that, Jessica, the Reverend Mother thought. If only she'd borne us a girl as she was ordered to do. Jessica stopped three paces from the chair, dropped a small curtsy, a gentle flick of the left hand along the line of her skirt. Paul gave the short bow his dancing master had taught, the one used when in doubt of another's station. The nuances of Paul's greeting were not lost on the Reverend Mother. She said, He's a cautious one, Jessica. Jessica's hand went to Paul's shoulder, tightened there. For a heartbeat, fear pulsed through her palm. Then she had herself under control. Thus he has been taught, Your Reverence. What does she fear? Paul wondered. The old woman studied Paul in one gestalton flicker, face oval like Jessica's, but strong bones, hair, the duke's black black, but with a brow line of a maternal grandfather who cannot be named, and that thin disdainful nose, shape of directly staring eyes, like the old duke, the paternal grandfather who is dead. Now there was a man who appreciated the power of bravura, even in death, the Reverend Mother thought. Teaching is one thing, she said. The basic ingredient is another. We shall see. The old eyes darted a hard glance at Jessica. Leave us. I enjoin you to practice the meditation of peace. Jessica took her hand from Paul's shoulder. Your reverence, I... Jessica, you know it must be done. Paul looked up as his mother, puzzled. Jessica straightened. Yes, of course. Paul looked back at the reverend mother. Politeness and his mother's obvious awe of this old woman argued caution. Yet he felt an angry apprehension at the fear he sensed radiating from his mother. Paul... Jessica took a deep breath. This test you're about to receive, it's important to me. Test? He looked up at her. Remember that you're a duke's son, Jessica said. She whirled and strode from the room with a dry swishing of her skirt. The door closed solidly behind. And Paul faced the old woman, holding anger in check. Does one dismiss for Lady Jessica as though she were a serving wench? A smile flickered the corners of a wrinkled old mouth. The Lady Jessica was my serving wench, lad, for fourteen years at school. She nodded. And a good one, too. 
Now you come here. You. The command whipped out at him. Paul found himself obeying before he could think about it. She's using the voice on me, he thought. He stopped at her jester, standing beside her knees. See this? she asked. From the folds of her gown, she lifted a green metal cube about fifteen centimeters on a side. She turned it, and Paul saw that one side was open, black and oddly frightening. No light penetrated that open blackness. Put your hand in the box, she said. Fear shot through Paul. He started to back away. But the old woman said, Is this how you obey your mother? He looked up into bird-bright eyes. Slowly, feeling the compulsions and unable to inhibit them, Paul put his hand into the box. He felt, first, a sense of cold as the blackness closed around his hand, then slick metal against his fingers, and a prickling as though his hand were asleep. A predatory look filled the old woman's features. She lifted her right hand away from the box and poised the hand close to the side of Paul's neck. He saw a glint of metal there and started to turn towards it. Stop! She snapped. She's using the voice again. He swung his attention back to her face. I hold at your neck the Gomjabar, she said. The Gomjabar, the high-handed enemy. It's a needle with a drop of poison on its tip. Ah, uh, ah! Uh, don't pull away, or you'll feel that poison. Paul tried to swallow in a dry throat. He could not take his attention from the seamed old face, the glistening eyes, the pale gums around silvery metal teeth that flashed as she spoke. A duke's son must know about poisons, she said. It's the way of our times, eh? Musky to be poisoned in your drink, Ormers to be poisoned in your food, the quick ones and the slow ones, and the ones in between. Here's a new one for you, the Gomjabar. It kills only animals. Pride overcame Paul's fear. You dare suggest a duke's son is an animal, he demanded. Let us say, I suggest, you may be human, she said. Steady. I warn you not to try jerking away. I am old, but my hand can drive this needle into your neck before you escape me. Who are you? he whispered. How did you trick my mother into leaving me alone with you? Are you from the Harkonnens? The Harkonnens? <laughs> Bless us, no. Now, be silent. A dry finger touched his neck, and he stilled the involuntary urge to leap away. Good, she said. You pass the first test. Now, here's the way of the rest of it. If you withdraw your hand from the box, you die. This is the only rule. Keep your hand in the box and live. Withdraw it and die. Paul took deep breaths to still his trembling. If I call out, there'll be servants on you in seconds, and you'll die. Servants will not pass your mother who stands guard outside that door. Depend on it. Your mother survived this test. Now it's your turn. Be honored. We seldom administer this to men, children. Curiosity reduced Paul's fear to a manageable level. He heard the truth in the old woman's voice, no denying it. If his mother stood guard out there, if this were truly a test, and whatever it was, he knew himself caught up in it, trapped by that hand at his neck, the Gomjabar. He recalled a response from the litany against fear as his mother had taught him out of a Bene Gesserit rite. I must not fear. Fear is the mind-killer. 
fear is for little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me, and when it has gone past I will return the inner eye to see its path. Wherever fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. He felt calmness return, and said, Get on with it, old woman. Old woman, she snapped. You've courage, and that can't be denied. Well, we shall see, said I. She bent close, lowered her voice almost to a whisper. You will feel pain in this hand within the box. Pain, but withdraw the hand and I'll touch your neck with my gomjabar. The death's so swift it's like the fall of the headsman's axe. Withdraw your hand and the gomjabar takes you. Understand? What's in the box? Pain. He felt an increased tingling in his hand, pressed his lips lightly together. How could this be a test, he wondered. The tingling became an itch. The old woman said, You've heard of animals chewing off a leg to escape a trap? <laughs> There's an animal kind of trick. A human would remain in the trap, endure the pain, feigning death that he might kill the trapper and remove a threat to his kind. The itch became the faintest burning. Why are you doing this? he demanded. To determine if you're human. Be silent. Paul clenched his left hand into a fist as the burning sensation increased in the other hand. It mounted slowly, heat upon heat upon heat upon heat. He felt the fingernails of his free hand biting the palm. He tried to flex the fingers of the burning hand, but couldn't move them. It burns, he whispered. Silence! Pain throbbed up his arm. Sweat stood out on his forehead. Every fibre cried out to withdraw the hand from the burning pit. But the Gomjabar. Without turning his head, he tried to move his eyes to see the terrible needle poised beside his neck. He sensed that he was breathing in gasps, tried to slow his breaths, and couldn't. Pain! His world emptied of everything except the hand immersed in agony, the ancient face inches away, staring at him. His lips were so dry he had difficulty separating them. The burning! The burning! He thought he could feel skin curling on the agonized hand, black flesh crisping and dropping away until only charred bones remained. It stopped! As though a switch had been turned off, the pain stopped. Paul felt his right arm trembling, felt sweat bathing his body. Enough! the old woman muttered. Kalwa had. No woman child ever withstood that much. I must have wanted you to fail. She leaned back, withdrawing the gomjabar from the side of his neck. Take your hand from the box, young human, and look at it. He fought down an aching shiver, stared at the lightless void where his hand seemed to remain of its own volition. Memory of pain inhibited his every movement. Reason told him he would withdraw a blackened stump from the box. Do it, she snapped. He jerked his hand from the box, stared at it astonished. Not a mark. No sign of agony of the flesh. He held up the hand, turned it, and flexed the fingers. Pain by nerve induction, she said. Can't go around maiming potential humans. There's those who'd give a pretty for the secret of this box, though. She slipped it into the folds of her gown. But for pain, he said. Pain? A human can override any nerve in the body. Paul felt his hand aching, 
uncurled the clenched fingers, looked at the four bloody marks where his fingernails had bitten into his palm. He dropped the hand to his side and looked at the old woman. You did that to my mother once? Ever sift sand for a screen? she asked. The tangential slash of her question shocked his mind into a higher awareness. Sand for a screen? He nodded. We Benny Gesserit sift people to find humans. He lifted his right hand, willing the memory of the pain. And that's all there is to it? Pain? I observed you in pain, lad. Pain's merely the axis of the test. Your mother told you about our ways of observing. I see the signs of her teaching in you. Our test is crisis and observation. He heard the confirmation in her voice, said, It's truth. She stared at him. He senses truth. Could he be the one? Could he truly be the one? She extinguished the excitement, reminding herself, Hope clouds observation. You know when people believe what they say, she said. I know it. The harmonics of ability confirmed by repeated test were in his voice. She heard them and said, Perhaps you are the Kwisatz Haderach. Sit down, little brother, here at my feet. I prefer to stand. Your mother sat at my feet once. I am not my mother. <laughs> you hate us a little, eh? She looked toward the door and called out, Jessica! The door flew open and Jessica stood there staring hard-eyed into the room. Hardness melted from her as she saw Paul. She managed a faint smile. Jessica, have you ever stopped hating me? The old woman asked. I both love and hate you, Jessica said. The hate, that's from pains I must never forget. The love, that's... Just the basic fact, the old woman said. But her voice was gentle. You may come in now, but remain silent. Close the door and mind it that no one interrupts us. Jessica stepped into the room, closed the door and stood with her back to it. My son lives, she thought. My son lives and is human. I knew he was, but... Everything in the room was immediate and pressing against her senses. My son lives. Paul looked at his mother. She told the truth. He wanted to get away alone and think this experience through, but he knew he could not leave until he was dismissed. The old woman had gained a power over him. They spoke truth. His mother had undergone this test. There must be a terrible purpose in it. The pain and the fear had been terrible. He understood terrible purposes. They drove against all odds. They were their own necessity. Paul felt that he had been infected with a terrible purpose. He did not know yet what that terrible purpose was. Some day, lad, the old woman said, you too may have to stand outside a door like that. It takes a measure of doing. Paul looked down at the hand that had known pain, then up to the Reverend Mother. The sound of her voice had contained a difference then from any other voice in his experience. The words were outlined in brilliance. There was an edge to them. He felt that any question he might ask her would bring an answer that could lift him out of his flesh world into something greater. Why do you test for humans? he asked. To set you free. Free? Once men turned their thinking over to machines in the hope that this would set them free, but that only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. 
Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a man's mind, Paul quoted. Right out of the Butlerian Jihad and the Orange Catholic Bible, she said. But what the OC Bible should have said is, Thou shalt not make a machine to counterfeit a human mind. Have you studied the Mentat in your service? I've studied with Furfirhawat. The Great Revolt took away a crutch, she said. It forced human minds to develop. Schools were started to train human talents. Many Jesuit schools? She nodded. We have two chief survivors of those ancient schools, the Bene Gesserit and the Spacing Guild. The Guild, so we think, emphasizes almost pure mathematics. Bene Gesserit perform another function. Politics, he said. Kalwahad, the old woman said. She sent a hard glance at Jessica. I've not told him, your reverence, Jessica said. The Reverend Mother returned her attention to Paul. You did that on remarkably few clues, she said. Politics indeed. The original Bene Gesserit was designed as a school by those who saw a need of a thread of continuity in human affairs. They saw that there could be no such continuity without separating human stock from animal stock for breeding purposes. The old woman's words abruptly lost their special sharpness for Paul. He felt an offence against what his mother called his instinct for rightness. It wasn't that the Reverend Mother lied to him. She obviously believed what she said. It was something deeper, something tied to this terrible purpose. He said, But my mother tells me many Bene Gesserit of the schools don't know their ancestry. The genetic lines are always in our records, she said. Your mother knows that either she's of Bene Gesserit descent, or her stock was acceptable in itself. Then why couldn't she know who her parents are? Some do, many don't. We might, for example, have wanted to breed her close to a relative to set up a dominant in some genetic trait. We have many reasons. Again, Paul felt the offence against rightness. He said, You take a lot on yourselves. The Reverend Mother stared at him, wondering, Did I hear criticism in his voice? We carry a heavy burden, she said. Paul felt himself coming more and more out of the shock of the test. He leveled a measuring stare at her and said, you say maybe I'm the Kwisat Sadarak. What's that? A human Gomjabar? Paul, Jessica said. You mustn't take that tone with... I'll handle this, Jessica, the old woman said. Now, lad, do you know about the Truthsayer drug? You take it to improve your ability to detect falsehood, you said. My mother's told me. Have you ever seen Truth Trance? He shook his head. No. The drug's dangerous, she said, but it gives insight. When a truthsayer is gifted by the drug, she can look many places in her memory, in her body's memory. We look down so many avenues of the past, but only feminine avenues. Her voice took on a note of sadness. Yet there's a place where no truthsayer can see. We are repelled by it, terrorized. It is said a man will come one day and find in the gift of the drug his inward eye. He will look where we cannot, into both feminine and masculine past. Your Kwisat Sadarak? Yes, the one who can be many places at once, the Kwisat Sadarak. Many men have tried the drug. So many. But none have succeeded. They tried and failed? All of them? Oh no! <laughs> she shook her head. They tried and died. 
thus completes chapter one. Guys, thank you very much for bearing with. That's chapter one of June. They're very brief. What did you guys think? Yo, your boy needs to drink loads of fluids. Dune, chapter two. Let's go. To attempt an understanding of Muad'Dib without understanding his mortal enemies, the Harkonnens, is to attempt seeing truth without knowing falsehood. It is the attempt to see light without knowing darkness. It cannot be. From the Manual of Muad'Dib by Princess Irulan. It was a relief globe of a world, partly in shadows, spinning under the impetus of a fat hand that glittered with rings. The globe sat on a free-form stand at one wall of a windowless room whose other walls represented a patchwork of multicolored scrolls, film books, tapes, and reels. Light glowed in a room from a golden ball hanging in a mobile suspensor field. An ellipsoid desk with a top of jade pink petrified elasia wood stood at the center of the room. Very form suspensor chairs ringed it, two of them occupied. In one sat a dark haired youth of about sixteen years, round of face and with sullen eyes. The other held a slender short man with an effeminate face. Both the youth and the man stared at the globe, and the man half hidden in shadows spinning it. A chuckle sounded beside the globe. A basso voice rumbled out of the chuckle. There it is, Biter. The biggest man trap in all history. And the duke's headed into its jaws. Is it not magnificent thing that I, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, do? Assuredly, Baron, said the man. His voice came out tenor with a sweet musical quality. The fat hand descended onto the globe, stopped the spinning. Now all eyes in the room could focus on the motionless surface and see that it was the kind of globe made for wealthy collectors or planetary governors of the Empire. It had a stamp of imperial handicraft about it. Latitude and longitude lines were laid with hair-fine platinum wire. The polar caps were insets of the finest cloud milk diamonds. The fat hand moved, tracing details on the surface. I invite you to observe, the basso voice rumbled. Observe closely, Piter, and you too, Fade Ralpha my darling, from sixty degrees north to seventy degrees south. These exquisite ripples, their colouring, does it not remind you of sweet caramels? And nowhere do you see blue of lakes or rivers or seas. And these lovely polar caps, so small. Could anyone mistake this place? Arrakis, truly unique, a superb setting for a unique victory. A smile touched Piter's lips. And to think, Baron, the Padishah Emperor believes he's given the Duke your spice planet. How poignant. That's a nonsensical statement, the Baron rumbled. You say this to confuse young Fade Ralpha, but it is not necessary to confuse my nephew. The sullen-faced youth stirred in his chair, smoothed a wrinkle in the black leotards he wore, and sat upright as a discreet tapping sounded at the door in the wall behind him. Piter unfolded from his chair, crossed to the door, cracked it wide enough to accept a message cylinder. He closed the door, unrolled the cylinder, and scanned it. A chuckle sounded from him. Another. Well, the Baron demanded. 
the fool answered us, Baron. Whenever did an Atreides refuse the opportunity for a gesture? The Baron asked. Well, what does he say? He's most uncouth, Baron. Addresses you as Harkonnen. No sire et cher cousin. No title. Nothing. It is a good name, the Baron growled, and his voice betrayed his impatience. What does clear, what does dear Leto say? He says your offer of a meeting is refused. I have oft times met your treachery, and this all men know. And? the Baron asked. He says, the art of Canley still has admirers in the Empire. He signs it, Duke Leto of Arrakis. Piter began to laugh. Of Arrakis! Oh my! This is almost too rich. Be silent, Piter, the Baron said, and the laughter stopped as though shut off with a switch. Canley, is it? the Baron asked. Vendetta, eh? And he uses the nice old word so rich with tradition to be sure that I know he means it. You made the peace gesture, Piter said. The forms have been obeyed. For a mentat, you talk too much, Piter, the Baron said. And he thought, I must do away with that one soon. He has almost outlived his usefulness. The Baron stared across the room at his mentat assassin, seeing the feature about him that most people noticed first, the eyes. The shaded slits of blue within blue, the eyes without any white in them at all. A grin flashed across Piter's face. It was like a mask grimace beneath those eyes like holes. But, Baron, never has revenge been more beautiful. It is to see a plan of the most exquisite treachery, to make Leto exchange Caladan for Dune, and without alternative, because the Emperor orders it. How waggish of you. In a cold voice, the Baron said, You have a flux of the mouth, Piter. But I am happy, my Baron, whereas you, you are touched by jealousy. Piter. Ah, ah, Baron. Is it not regrettable that you were unable to devise this delicious scheme by yourself? Some day I will have you strangled, Piter. Of a certainty, Baron. Enfin. But a kind act is never lost, eh? Have you been chewing the right or simuture, Piter? Truth without fear surprises the Baron, Piter said. His face drew down into a caricature of a frowning mask. Aha! But you see, Baron. I know as a mentat when you will send the executioner. You will hold back just so long as I am useful. To move sooner would be wasteful, and I'm yet of much use. I know what it is you learned from that lovely dune planet. Waste not. True, Baron? The Baron continued to stare at Piter. Fade Ralpha squirmed in his chair. These wrangling fools, he thought. My uncle cannot talk to his mentat without arguing. Do they think I've nothing to do except listen to their arguments? Fade, the Baron said. I told you to listen and learn when I invited you in here. Are you learning? Yes, uncle. The voice was carefully subservient. Sometimes I wonder about Piter, the Baron said. I cause pain out of necessity, but he, I swear he takes a positive delight in it. For myself, I can feel pity towards the poor Duke Leto. Dr. Yue will move against him soon, and that'll be an end of all of the Atreides. But surely Leto will know whose hand directed the pliant doctor, and knowing will be a terrible thing. Then why haven't you directed the doctor to slip a kinjal between his ribs? 
quietly and efficiently. You talk of pity, but... The Duke must know when I encompass his doom, the Baron said, and the other great houses must learn of it. The knowledge will give them pause. I'll gain a bit more room to maneuver. The necessity is obvious, but I don't have to like it. Room to maneuver, Piter sneered. Already you have the Emperor's eyes on you, Baron. You move too boldly. One day the Emperor will send a legion or two of his Satukar down here into Gidi Prime, and that'll be an end to the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. You'd like to see that, wouldn't you, Piter? the Baron asked. You'd enjoy seeing the corp of Sardaukar pillage through my cities and sack this castle. You'd truly enjoy that. Does the Baron need to ask? Piter whispered. You should have been a Bashar of a corpse, the Baron said. You're too interested in blood and pain. Perhaps I was too quick with my promise of the spoils of Arrakis. Piter took five curiously mincing steps into the room, stopped directly behind Fade Ralpha. There was a tight air of tension in the room, and the youth looked up at Piter with a worried frown. Do not toy with Piter, Baron, Piter said. You promised me the Lady Jessica. You promised her to me. For what, Piter? the Baron asked. For pain. Piter stared at him, dragging out for silence. Fade Ralpha moved his suspenser chair to one side and said, Uncle, do I have to stay? You said you'd... My darling Fade Ralpha grows impatient, the Baron said. He moved within the shadows beside the globe. Patience, Fade. And he turned his attention back to the Mentat. What of the dukeling, the child Paul, my dear Piter? The trap will bring him to you, Baron, Piter muttered. That's not my question, the Baron said. You'll recall that you predicted the Bene Gesserit witch would bear a daughter to the duke. You were wrong, eh, Mentat? I'm not often wrong, Baron, Piter said. And for the first time, there was fear in his voice. Give me that. I'm not often wrong. And you know yourself these Bene Gesserit bear mostly daughters. Even the Emperor's consort has produced only females. Uncle, said Fade Ralpha, you said there'd be something important here for me to listen to my nephew, the Baron said. He aspires to rule my barony, yet he cannot rule himself. The Baron stirred beside the globe. A shadow among shadows. Well then, Fade Ralpha Harkonnen, I summoned you here hoping to teach you a bit of wisdom. Have you observed our good Mentat? You should have learned something from this exchange. But, Uncle, a most efficient Mentat, Piter, wouldn't you say, Fade? Yes, but. Ah! Indeed, but. But he consumes too much spice, eats it like candy. Look at his eyes. He might have come directly from the Arakeen labor pool. Efficient, Piter. But he's still emotional and prone to passionate outbursts. Efficient, Piter. But he can still err. Piter spoke in a low, sullen tone. Did you call me in here to impair my efficiency with criticism, Baron? Impair your efficiency? You know me better, Piter. I wish only for my nephew to understand the limitations of a mentat. Are you already training my replacement? Piter demanded. Replace you? Why, Piter, where would I find another mentat with your cunning and venom? The same place you found me, Baron. Perhaps I should at that, the Baron mused. You do seem a bit unstable lately. And the spice you eat. Are my pleasures too expensive, Baron? 
Do you object to them? My dear Piter, your pleasures are what tie you to me. How could I object to that? I merely wish my nephew to observe this about you. Then I'm on display, Piter said. Shall I dance? Shall I perform my various functions for the eminent Fade Ralph? Precisely, the Baron said. You are on display. Now be silent. He glanced at Fade Ralpha, noting his nephew's lips, the full and pouting look of them. The Harkonnen genetic marker now twisted slightly in amusement. This is a mentat, Fade. It has been trained and conditioned to perform certain duties. The fact that it's encased in a human body, however, must not be overlooked. A serious drawback, that. I sometimes think the ancients, with their thinking machines, had the right idea. They were toys compared to me, Piter snarled. You yourself, Baron, could outperform those machines. Perhaps, the Baron said. Ah, oh, well. He took a deep breath, belched. Now, Piter, outline for my nephew the salient features of our campaign against the House of Atreides. Function as a mentat for us, if you please. Baron, I've warned you not to trust one so young with this information. My observations of— I'll be the judge of this, the Baron said. I give you an order, Mentat. Perform one of your various functions. So be it, Piter said. He straightened, assuming an odd attitude of dignity, as though it were another mask, but this time clothing his entire body. In a few days standard, the entire household of Duke Leto will embark on a spacing guild liner for Arrakis. The guild will deposit them at the city of Arrakeen rather than our city of Carfag. The duke's mentat, Thirthir Hoat, will have concluded rightly that Arrakeen is easier to defend. Listen carefully, Fade, the Baron said. Observe the plans within plans within plans. Fade Ralfua nodded, thinking, This is more like it. The old monster is letting me in on secret things at last. He really must mean for me to be his heir. There are several tangential possibilities, Piter said. I indicate that House Atreides will go to Arrakis. We must not, however, ignore the possibility the Duke has contracted with the Guild to remove him to a place of safety outside the system. Others in like circumstances have become renegade houses, taking family atomics and shields and fleeing beyond the Imperium. The Duke is too proud of a man for that, the Baron said. It is a possibility, Piter said. The ultimate effect for us would be the same, however. No, it would not, the Baron growled. I must have him dead and his line ended. That's the high probability, Piter said. There are certain preparations that indicate when a house is going renegade. The Duke appears to be doing none of these things. So, the Baron sighed, get on with it, Piter. At Arakeen, Piter said, the Duke and his family will occupy the residency, lately the home of Count and Lady Fenring. The ambassador to the smugglers, the Baron chuckled. Ambassador to what? Fade Ralph asked. Your uncle makes a joke, Piter said. He calls Count Fenring ambassador to the smugglers, indicating the Emperor's interest in smuggling operations on Arrakis. Fade Ralph turned a puzzled stare on his uncle. Why? Don't be dense, Fade, the Baron snapped. As long as the guild remains effectively outside Imperial control, how could it be otherwise? How else could spies and assassins move about? Fade Ralph's mouth made a soundless, Oh. We've arranged diversions at the residency, Biter said. 
there will be an attempt on the life of the Atreides heir. An attempt which could succeed. Fighter, the Baron rumbled. You indicated. I indicated accidents can happen, Fighter said. And the attempt must appear valid. Ah, <sighs> but the lad has such a sweet young body, the Baron said. Of course, he's potentially more dangerous than the father. But that which... But with that witch mother training him, <sighs> a cursed woman. Oh, well, please continue, Piter. Hawat will have divined that we have an agent planted on him, Piter said. The obvious suspect is Dr. Yue, who is indeed our agent. But Hawat has investigated and found that our doctor is a Sook school graduate with the Imperial conditioning supposedly safe enough to minister even to the Emperor. Great store is set on Imperial conditioning. It's assumed that ultimate conditioning cannot be removed without killing the subject. However, as someone once observed, given the right lever, you can move a planet. We found the lever that moved the Doctor. How? Fade Ralpha asked. He found this fascinating subject. Everyone knew you couldn't subvert Imperial conditioning. Another time, the Baron said. Continue, Piter. In place of Yue, Piter said, will drag a most interesting suspect across Hoat's path. The very audacity of this suspect will recommend her to Hoat's attention. Her? Fade Ralpha asked. The Lady Jessica herself. The Baron said. Is it not sublime? Piter asked. Hawat's mind will be so filled with this prospect it'll impair his function as a mentat. He may even try to kill her. Piter frowned, and then... But I don't think he'll be able to carry it off. You don't want him to, eh? The Baron asked. Don't distract me. Piter said, while Hoat's occupied with the Lady Jessica, will divert him further with uprisings in a few garrison towns and the like. These will be put down. The Duke must believe he's gaining a measure of security. And then? When the moment is ripe, we'll signal Yue and move in with our major force. Ah. Uh... Go ahead. Tell him all of it, the Baron said. We'll move in, strengthened by two legions of Sadukar disguised in Harkonnen livery. Sadukar! Fade Ralph breathed. His mind focused on the dread Imperial troops, the killers without mercy, the soldier fanatics of the Padishah Emperor. You see how I trust you, Fade, the Baron said. No hint of this must ever reach another great house, else the Lansrad might unite against the Imperial House, and there'd be chaos. The main point, Piter said, is this. Since House Harkonnen is being used to do the Imperial dirty work, we've gained a true advantage. It's a dangerous advantage, to be sure. But if used cautiously, will bring House Harkonnen greater wealth than that of any other house in the Imperium. You have no idea how much wealth is involved, Fade, the Baron said. Not in your wildest imaginings. To begin, we'll have an irrevocable directorship in the Chome Company. Fade Ralpha nodded. Wealth was the thing and Chome was the key to wealth. Each of, the noble, each of the noble houses dipping from the company's coffers whatever it could under, under the power of directorships. Those Chome directorships, they were the real evidence of political power in the Imperium, passing with the shifts of voting strength within the Lansrad as it balanced itself against the Emperor and his supporters. The Duke Leto, Piter said, may attempt to flee to the few Fremen scum along the desert's edge, or he may try to send his family into that imagined security. The 
but that path is blocked by one of his majesty's agents, the planetary ecologist. You may remember him, Hines. Fade remembers him, the Baron said. Get on with it. You do not drool very prettily, Baron, Piter said. Get on with it, I command you, the Baron roared. Piter shrugged. If matters go as planned, he said, House Harkonnen will have a sub fife on Arrakis within a standard year. Your uncle will have dispensation of that fife. His own personal agent will rule on Arrakis. More profits, Fade Ralpher said. Indeed. Indeed, the Baron said. And he thought, it's only just. We're the ones who've tamed Arrakis. Except for the few, mon few mongrel Fremen hiding in the skirts of the desert, and some tame smugglers bound to the planet almost as tightly as the native labor pool. And the great houses will know that the Baron has destroyed the Atreides, Piter said. They will know. They will know, the Baron breathed. Loveliest of all, Piter said, is that the Duke will know too. He knows now. He can already feel the trap. It's true, the Duke knows, the Baron said, and his voice held a note of sadness. He could not help but know, more's the pity. The Baron moved out and away from the globe of Arrakis. As he emerged from the shadows, his figure took on dimension, grossly and immensely fat, and with the subtle bulges beneath the folds of his dark robes to reveal that all of this fat was sustained partly by portable suspensers harnessed to his flesh. His might weighed 200 standard kilos in actuality, but his feet would carry no more than 50 of them. I am hungry, the Baron rumbled, and he rubbed his protruding lips with a beringed hand, stared down at Fade Ralpha through fat enfolded eyes. Send for food, my darling. We will eat before we retire. Thus ends chapter two. Mikey, Vladimir Harkonnen cosplay when? Oh, Fred Zoom, how dare you? Outrageous, outrageous. Welcome to chapter three of Dune. Thus spoke Saint Alia of the Knife. The Reverend Mother must combine the seductive wiles of a courtesan with the untouchable majesty of a virgin goddess. Holding these attributes in tension so long as the powers of her youth endure. For when youth and beauty have gone, she will find that in their place between, once occupied by tension, has become instead a wellspring of cunning and resourcefulness. From the Muad'Dib Family Commentaries by the Princess Irulan Well, Jessica, what have you to say for yourself? asked the Reverend Mother. It was near sunset at Castle Caladan on the day of Paul's ordeal. The two women were alone in Jessica's morning room, while Paul waited in the adjoining soundproofed meditation chamber. Jessica stood facing the south windows. She saw and yet did not see that evening's banked colours across the meadow and river. She heard and yet did not hear the Reverend Mother's question. There had been another ordeal here once, so many years ago. A skinny girl with hair the colour of bronze, her body tortured by the winds of puberty, had entered the study of the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Moahim, protector superior of the Bene Gesserit school on Wallach Nine. Jessica looked down at her right hand, flexed the fingers, remembering the pain, the terror, the anger. Poor Paul, she whispered. I asked you a question, Jessica. The old woman's voice was snappish, demanding. What? Oh. Jessica tore her attention away from the past, faced the Reverend Mother, 
who sat with back to the stone wall between the two west windows. What do you want me to say? What do I want you to say? What do I want you to say? The old voice carried a tone of cruel mimicry. So I had a son, Jessica flared, and she knew she was being goaded into this anger deliberately. You were told to bear only daughters to the Atreides. It meant so much to him, Jessica pleaded. And you, in your pride, thought you could produce for Kwisatz Haderach. Jessica lifted her chin. I sensed the possibility. You thought only of your duke's desire for a son, the old woman snapped. And his desires don't figure into this. An Atreides daughter could have wed to a Harkonnen heir and sealed the breach. You've hopelessly complicated matters. We may lose both bloodlines now. You're not infallible, Jessica said. She braved the steady stare from the old eyes. Presently, the old woman muttered, What's done is done. I vowed never to regret my decision, Jessica said. How noble, the Reverend Mother sneered. No regrets. We shall see when you're a fugitive with a price on your head and every man's hand turned against you to seek your life and the life of your son. Jessica paled. Is there no alternative? Alternative? A Benny Gesserit should ask that. I ask only what you see in the future with your superior abilities. I see in the future what I've seen in the past. You well know the pattern of our affairs, Jessica. The race knows its own mortality and fears stagnation of its heredity. It's in the bloodstream. The urge to mingle genetic strains without plan. The Imperium, the Chome Company, all the great houses. They are but bits of flotsam in the path of the flood. Chome, Jessica muttered. I suppose it's already decided how they'll redivide the spoils of Arrakis. What is Chome but the weather vane of our times? The old woman said. The Emperor and his friends now command 59.65% of the Chome Directorship's votes. Certainly they smell profits, and likely as the others smell those same profits that his voting strength will increase. This is the pattern of history, girl. That's certainly what I need right now, Jessica said. A review of history. Don't be facetious, girl. You know as well as I what forces surround us. We have a three-point civilization. The Imperial Household balanced against the Federated Great Houses of the Lansrad, and between them, the Guild, with its damnable monopoly on interstellar transport. In politics, the tripod is the most unstable of all structures. It'd be bad enough without the complication of a feudal trade culture which turns its back on most science. And Jessica spoke bitterly. Chips in the path of a flood, and this chip here, this is for Duke Leto, and this one, his son, and this one. No, oh, shut up, girl! You entered this with full knowledge of the delicate edge you walked. I am a Benny Jesuit. I exist only to serve, Jessica quoted. Truth, the old woman said. And all we can hope for now is to prevent this from erupting into a general conflagration to salvage what we can of the key bloodlines. Jessica closed her eyes, feeling tears pressed out beneath the lids. She fought down the inner trembling, the outer trembling, the uneven breathing, the ragged pulse, the sweating of the palms. Presently, she said, I'll pay for my own mistake. And your son will pay with you. I'll shield him as well as I'm able. Shield? The old woman snapped. You well know the weakness there. Shield your son too much, Jessica, and he'll not grow strong enough to fulfill any destiny. Jessica turned away, looked out to the window at the gathering darkness. Is it really that terrible, this planet of Arrakis? Bad enough, but not all bad. The Missionaria Protectiva has been in there and softened it up somewhat. 
The Reverend Mother herself got to her feet, straightened a fold in her gown. All of a boy in here. I must be leaving soon. Must you? The old woman's voice softened. Jessica, girl, I wish I could stand in your place and take your sufferings, but each of us must make her own path. I know. You're as dear to me as any of my own daughters, but I cannot let that interfere with duty. I understand the necessity. What you did, Jessica, and why you did it, we both know. But kindness forces me to tell you there's little chance your lad will be the Benny Jesuit totality. You mustn't let yourself hope too much. Jessica shook tears from the corners of her eyes. It was an angry gesture. You make me feel like a little girl again, reciting my first lesson. She forced the words out. Humans must never submit to animals. A dry sob shook her. In a low voice, she said, I've been so lonely. It should be one of the tests, the old woman said. Humans are almost always lonely. Now summon the boy. He's had a long and frightening day, but he's had time to think and remember, and I must ask the other questions about these dreams of his. Jessica nodded and went to the door of the meditation chamber, opened it. Paul, come in now, please. Paul emerged with a stubborn slowness. He stared at his mother as though she were a stranger. Weariness veiled his eyes when he glanced at the Reverend Mother. But this time he nodded to her. The not one gives an equal. He heard his mother close the door behind him. Young man, the old woman said, let's return to this dream business. What do you want? he asked. Do you dream every night? Not dreams worth remembering. I can remember every dream, but some are worth remembering and some aren't. How do you know the difference? I just know it. The old woman glanced at Jessica. Back to Paul. What did you dream last night? Was it worth remembering? Yes. Paul closed his eyes. I dreamed a cavern, and water, and a girl there, very skinny with big eyes. Her eyes are all blue, with no whites in them. I talk to her, and I tell her about you, about seeing the Reverend Mother on Caladan. Paul opened his eyes. And the thing you tell this strange girl about seeing me, did it happen today? Paul thought about this, and then, Yes, I tell the girl you came and put a stamp of strangeness on me. A stamp of strangeness? The old woman breathed, and again she shot a glance at Jessica, returned her attention to Paul. Tell me truly now, Paul. Do you often have dreams of things that happen afterward exactly as you dreamed them? Yes, and I've dreamed about that girl before. Oh, you know her. I will know her. Tell me about her. Again, Paul closed his eyes. We're in a little place in some rocks where it's sheltered. It's almost night, but it's hot, and I can see patches of sand out on an opening in the rocks. We're waiting for something, for me to go and meet some people, and she's frightened, but she's trying to hide it from me, and I'm excited, and she says, tell me about the waters of your homeworld, Usul. Paul opened his eyes. Isn't that strange? My homeworld's Caladan. I've never even heard of a planet called Usul. Is there more to this dream? Jessica prompted. Yes, but maybe she was calling me Usul, Paul said. I just thought of that. Again, he closed his eyes. She asked me to tell her about the waters, and I take her hand, and I say that I'll tell her a poem. And I tell her a poem, but I have to explain some of the words, like beach and surf, and seaweed and seagulls. 
What poem? the Reverend Mother asked. Paul opened his eyes. It's just one of Gurney Halleck's tone poems for sad times. Behind Paul, Jessica began to recite. I remember salt smoke from a beach fire and shadows under the pines. Solid, clean, fixed. Seagulls perched at the tip of land, white upon green, and wind comes through the pines. To sway the shadows, the seagulls spread their wings, lift, and fill the sky with screeches, and I hear the wind blowing across our beach and the surf, and I see that our fire has scorched the seaweed. That's for one, Paul said. The old woman stared at Paul, then, Young man, as proctor of the Bene Gesserit, I seek for Kwisatz Haderach, the male who truly can become one of us. Your mother sees this possibility in you, but she sees with the eyes of a mother. Possibility I see, too, but no more. She fell silent, and Paul swore that she wanted him to speak. He waited her out. Presently, she said, As you will, then. You've depths in you, that I'll grant. May I go now? he asked. Don't you want to hear what the Reverend Mother can tell you about the Kwisatz Sadarak? Jessica asked. She said those who tried for it died. But I can help you with a few hints at why they failed, the Reverend Mother said. She talks of hints. Paul thought. She doesn't really know anything. And he said, Hint then, and be damned to me. She smiled wryly, a crisscross of wrinkles in the old face. Very well. That which submits rules. He felt astonishment. She was talking about such elementary things as tension within meaning. Did she think his mother had taught him nothing at all? That's a hint, he asked. We're not here to bandy words or quibble over their meanings, the old woman said. The willow submits to the wind and prospers until one day many willows, a wall against the wind. This is the willow's purpose. Paul stared at her. She said purpose, and he felt the word buffet him, reinfecting him with that terrible purpose. He experienced a sudden anger at her, fatuous old witch with her mouth full of platitudes. You think I could be this Kwisatz Sadarak, he said. You talk about me, but you haven't said one thing we can do to help my father. I've heard you talking to my mother. You talk as if though my father were dead. Well, he isn't. If there were a thing to be done for him, we'd have done it, the old woman growled. We may be able to salvage you. Doubtful, but possible. But for your father, nothing. When you've learned to accept that as a fact, you've learned a real Bene Gesserit lesson. Poor saw how the words shook his mother. He glared at the old woman. How could she say such a thing about his father? What made her so sure? His mind seethed with resentment. The Reverend Mother looked at Jessica. You've been training him in the way. I've seen the signs of it. I'd have done the same in your shoes, and devil take the rules. Jessica nodded. Now I caution you, said the old woman, to ignore the regular order of training. His own safety requires the voice. He already has a good start in it, but we both know how much more he needs. And that desperately. She stepped close to Paul, staring him down. Goodbye, young human. I hope you make it, but if you don't, well, we shall yet succeed. Once more she looked at Jessica. A flicker sign of understanding passed between them. Then the old woman swept from the room, her robes hissing with not another backward glance. The room and its occupants already were shut from her thoughts. But Jessica had caught one glimpse of the Reverend Mother's face as she turned away. There had been tears on those seamed cheeks. The tears were more unnerving 
than any other word or sign that have passed between them this day. So ends chapter 3. Thank you very much for listening in, guys. I'll see you soon. Welcome to chapter 4 of Dune. You have read that Muad'Dib had no playmates his own age on Caladan. The dangers were too great. But Muad'Dib did have some wonderful companion teachers. There was Gurney Halleck, the troubadour warrior. You will sing some of Gurney's songs as you read along in this book. There was Fufir Hawat, the old Mentat master of assassins who struck fear even into the heart of the Padishar Emperor. There were Duncan Idaho, the swordmaster of the Ginaz, Dr. Wellington Yue, a name black in treachery, but bright in knowledge, the Lady Jessica, who guided her son in the Bene Gesserit way, and of course, Duke Leto, whose qualities as a father have long been overlooked. From a Child's History of Muad'Dib by the Princess Irulan Fufir Hawat slipped into the training room of Castle Caladan, closed the door softly. He stood there a moment, feeling old and tired and storm-levered. His left leg ached where it had been slashed once, in the service of the old duke. Three generations of them now, he thought. He stared across the big room, bright with the light of the noon pouring through the skylights, saw the boy seated with back to the door, intent on papers and charts spread across an L table. How many times must I tell that lad never to settle himself with his back to a door? Hoat cleared his throat. Paul remained bent over his studies. A cloud shadow passed over the skylights. Again, Hoat cleared his throat. Paul straightened, spoke without turning. I know. I'm sitting with my back to a door. Hoat suppressed a smile, strode across the room. Paul looked up at the grizzled old man who stopped at a corner of the table. Hoat's eyes were two pools of alertness in a dark and deeply seamed face. I heard you coming down the hall, Paul said, and I heard you open the door. The sounds I make could be imitated. I'd know the difference. He might at that, Hoat thought. That witch mother of his is giving him the deep training, certainly. I wonder what her precious school thinks of that. Maybe that's why they sent the old proctor here to whip our dear Lady Jessica into line. Hoat pulled up a chair across from Paul, sat down facing the door. He did it pointedly, leaned back and studied the room. It struck him as an odd place suddenly, a stranger place, with most of its hardware already gone off to Arrakis. A training table remained, and a fencing mirror with its crystal prisms quiescent, the target dummy beside it patched and padded, looking like an ancient foot soldier, maimed and battered in the wars. There stand I, Hoat thought. Fufia, what are you thinking? Paul asked. Hoat looked at the boy. I was thinking we'll all be out of here soon, and likely never see the place again. Does that make you sad? Sad? <laughs> Nonsense. Parting with friends is a sadness. A place is only a place. He glanced at the charts on the table. And Arrakis is just another place. Did my father send you up to test me? Hoat scowled. The boy had such an observing way about him. He nodded. You're thinking it'd have been nicer if he'd come up himself. But you must know how busy he is. He'll be along later. I've been studying about the storms on Arrakis. The storms? I see. They sound pretty bad. That's too cautious a word, bad. Those storms build up across six or seven thousand kilometers of flatlands, feed on anything that can give them a push. Coriolis force, other storms, anything that has an ounce of energy in it. They can blow up to seven hundred kilometers an hour, loaded with everything loose that's in their way. Sand, dust, everything. They can eat flesh off bones and edge for bones to slivers. Why don't they have weather control? Arrakis has special problems. The costs are higher and there'd be maintenance and the like. The guild wants a dreadful high price for satellite control. And your father's house isn't one of the big rich ones, lad. You know that. 
have you ever seen for Fremen? Vlad's mind is darting all over today, Hoat thought. Like as not I've seen them, he said. There's little to tell them from the folk of Graben and Sink. They all wear those great flowing robes, and they stink to heaven in any closed space. It's from those suits they wear, all of them still suits, that reclaim the body's own water. Paul swallowed, suddenly aware of a moisture in his mouth, remembering a dream of thirst. That people could want so for water, that they had to recycle their body moisture, struck him with a feeling of desolation. Water's precious there, he said. Hoat nodded, thinking, Perhaps I'm doing it, getting across to him the importance of this planet as an enemy. It's madness to go in there without caution in our minds. Paul looked up at the skylight, aware that it had begun to rain. He saw the spreading wetness on the grey metaglass. Water, he said. You'll learn a great concern for water, Hoat said. As the Duke's son, you'll never want for it, but you'll see the pressures of thirst all around you. Paul wet his lips with his tongue, thinking back to the day a week ago and the ordeal with the Reverend Mother. She, too, had said something about water starvation. You'll learn about the funeral plains, she'd said, about the wilderness that is empty, the wasteland where nothing lives except the spice and the sandworms, or oh, you'll stain your eye pits to reduce the sun glare, and shelter will mean a hollow out of a wind and hidden from view. You'll ride upon your own two feet, without fopter or ground car or mount. And Paul had been caught more by her tone, sing-song and wavering, than by her words. When you live upon Arrakis, she had said, Kala, the land is empty. The moons will be your friends, the sun your enemy. Paul had sensed his mother come up beside him, away from her post guarding the door. She had looked at the reverend mother and asked, Do you see no hope, your reverence? Not for the father. And the old woman had waved Jessica to silence, looked down at Paul. Grave this on your memory, lad. A world is supported by four things. She held up four big knuckled fingers. The learning of the wise, the justice of the great, the prayers of the righteous, and the valour of the brave. But all these are as nothing. She closed the fingers into her fist. Without a ruler who knows the art of ruling, make that the science of your tradition. A week had passed since the day with the Reverend Mother. Her words were only now beginning to come into full register. Now, sitting in the training room with Fufir Hoat, Paul felt a sharp pang of fear. He looked across at the Mentat's puzzled frown. Were you wool gathering that time? Hoat asked. Did you meet the Reverend Mother? That truth say a witch from the Imperium. Hoat's eyes quickened with interest. I met her. She... Paul hesitated found that he couldn't tell Hawat about the ordeal. The inhibitions went deep. Yes, what did she? Paul took two deep breaths. She said a thing. He closed his eyes, calling up the words, and when he spoke his voice unconsciously took on some of the old woman's tone. You, Paul Atreides, descendant of kings, son of a duke, you must learn to rule. It is something none of your ancestors learned. Paul opened his eyes, said, That made me angry, and I said my father rules an entire planet, and she said, He's losing it, and I said my father was getting a richer planet, and she said, He'll lose that one too, and I wanted to run and warn my father, but she said he'd already been warned, by you, by mother, by many people. True enough, Hoat muttered. Then why are we going? Paul demanded. Because the Emperor ordered it, and because there's hope in spite of what that witch spy said. What else spouted from this ancient fountain of wisdom? Paul looked down at his right hand clenched into a fist beneath the table. Slowly he willed the muscles to relax. She put some kind of hold on me, he thought. How? 
She asked me to tell her what it is to rule, Paul said, and I said that one commands, and she said that I had some unlearning to do. Mm, she hit a mark there right enough, Owat thought. He nodded for Paul to continue. She said a ruler must learn to persuade and not to compel. She said he must lay the best coffee half to attract the finest men. How'd she figure your father attracted men like Duncan and Gurney? Howat asked. Paul shrugged. Then she said a good ruler has to learn his world's language, but it's different for every world. And I thought she meant they didn't speak Galak on Arrakis, but she said it wasn't that at all. She said she meant the language of the rocks and growing things, the language you don't hear just with your ears. And I said, that's what Dr. Yue calls the mystery of life. Hawat chuckled. <laughs> How'd that sit with her? I think she got mad. She said the mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. So I quoted the first law of the Mentat at her. A process cannot be understood by stopping it. Understanding must move with the flow of the process, must join with it and flow with it. That seemed to satisfy her. He seems to be getting over it, Hawat thought. But that old witch frightened him. Why did she do it? Fufir, Paul said. Will Arrakis be as bad as she said? Nothing could be that bad, Hoat said, and forced a smile. Take those Fremen, for example. The renegade people of the desert. By first approximation analysis, I can tell you that there are many, many more of them than the Imperium suspects. People live there, lad. A great many people. And... Hoat put a sinewy finger beside his eye. They hate Harkonnens with a bloody passion. You must not breathe a word of this, lad. I tell you only as your father's helper. My father has told me of Seleucus Secundus, Paul said. Do you know, Fufir, it sounds much like Arrakis. Perhaps not quite as bad, but much like it. We do not really know of Seleucus Secundus today, Hoat said. Only what it was like long ago, mostly. But what is known, you're right on that score. Will the Fremen help us? It's a possibility. Oat stood up. I leave today for Arrakis. Meanwhile, you take care of yourself for an old man who's fond of you, eh? Come around here like the good lad and sit facing the door. It's not that I think there's any danger in the castle. It's just a habit I want you to form. Paul got to his feet moved around the table. You're going today? Today it is, and you'll be following tomorrow. Next time we meet, it'll be on the soil of your new world. He gripped Paul's right arm at the bicep. Keep your knife arm free, eh? And your shield at full charge. He released the arm, patted Paul's shoulder, whirled and strode quickly to the door. Fufir, Paul called. Hoat turned, standing in the open doorway. Don't sit with your back to any doors, Paul said. A grin spread across the seamed old face. That I won't, lad. Depend on it. And he was gone, shutting the door softly behind. Paul sat down where Hawat had been, straightened for papers. One more day here, he thought. He looked around the room. We're leaving. The idea of departure was suddenly more real to him than it had ever been before. He recalled another thing the old woman had said about a world being the sum of many things. The people, the dirt, the growing things, the moons, the tides, the suns. The unknown sum called nature. A vague summation without any sense of the now. And he wondered, what is the now? The door across from Paul banged open and an ugly lump of a man lurched through it preceded by a handful of weapons. Well, Gurney Halleck, Paul called. Are you the new weapons master? Halleck kicked the door shut with one heel. It rather I came to play games, I know, he said. He glanced around the room, noting that Howat's men had already been over it, checking, making it safe for a duke's heir. The subtle code signs were all around. Paul watched the rolling, ugly man set himself back in motion veer towards the training table with the load of weapons. 
saw the nine-string balisette strung over Gurney's shoulder with the multi-pack woven through the strings near the head of the fingerboard. Halleck dropped the weapons on the exercise table, lined them up. The rapiers, the bodkins, the kinjals, the slow pellet stunners, the shield belts. The ink vine scar along his jawline writhed as he turned, casting a smile across the room. So you don't even have a good morning for me, young imp, Halleck said. And what barb did you sink in old Hawat? He passed me in the hall like a man running to his enemy's funeral. Paul grinned. Of all of his father's men, he liked Gurney Halleck the best, knew the man's moods and deviltry, his humours, and thought of him more as a friend than a hired sword. Halleck swung the bally set off his shoulder, began tuning it. If you won't talk, you won't, he said. Paul stood, advanced across the room, calling out, Well, Gurney, do we come prepared for music when it's fighting time? So it's sass for your elders today, Halleck said. He tried a chord on the instrument, nodded. Where's Duncan Idaho? Paul asked. Isn't he supposed to be teaching me weaponry? Duncan's gone, lad, to lead the second wave onto Alakis, Alex said. All you have left is poor Gurney, who's fresh out of fight and spoiling for music. He struck another chord, listened to it, and smiled. And it was decided in council that you being such a poor fighter, we'd best teach you the music trade so you won't waste your entire life. Maybe you'd better sing me a lay then, Paul said. I want to be sure how not to do it. Aha! Gurney laughed, and he swung into Galatian Girls, his multi-pick a blur over the strings as he sang. Oh, the Galatian Girls will do it for pearls, and they are keen for water, but if you desire dames like consuming flames, try a Caledon daughter. Not bad for such poor hand with a pick, Paul said. But if my mother heard you singing a bawdy like that in the castle, she'd have your ears on the outer wall for decoration. Gurney pulled at his left ear. Poor decoration, too. They having been bruised so much at listening at keyholes, whilst a young lad I know practiced some strange ditties on his belly set. So you've forgotten what it's like to find sand in your bed, Paul said. He pulled a shield belt from the table, buckled it fast around his waist. Then let's fight. Alex's eyes went wide in mock surprise. So, it was your wicked hand did that deed? Guard yourself today, young master. Guard yourself. He grabbed up a rapier, laced the air with it. I'm a hell fiend out for revenge. Paul lifted the companion rapier, bent it in his hands, stood in the aguil, one foot forward. He let his manner go solemn in a comic imitation of Dr. Yue. What adult my father sent me for weaponry, Paul intoned. This doltish gurney Halleck has forgotten a first lesson for a fighting man armed and shielded. Paul snapped the force button at his waist, felt the crinkled skin tingling of the defensive field at his forehead and down his back, heard external sounds take on a characteristic shield-filtered flatness. In shield fighting, one moves fast on defense, slow on attack, Paul said. Attack has the sole purpose of tricking the opponent into a misstep, setting him up for attack sinister. The shield turns the fast blow, admits the slow kin jowl. Paul snapped up the rapier, fainted fast, and whipped it back for a slow thrust timed to enter a shield's mindless defenses. Halleck watched the action turned at the last minute to let the blunted blade pass his chest. Speed, excellent, he said. But you were wide open for an underhanded counter with the slip tip. Paul stepped back, chagrined. I should whap your backside for such carelessness, Alex said. He lifted a naked kinjal from the table and held it up. This, in the hand of an enemy, can let out your life's blood. You're an apt pupil, none better, but... I've warned you that not even in play do you will let a man inside your guard with death in his hands. I guess I'm not in the mood for it today, Paul said. Mood! Halleck's voice betrayed his outrage, even through the shield's filtering. What has mood got to do with it? You fight when the necessity arises, no matter the mood. Mood's a thing for cattle, or making love, or playing the balisette. It's not for fighting. I'm sorry, Gurney. You're not sorry enough. Halleck activated his own shield, 
crouched with the Kindle out thrust in his left hand, the rapier poised high in his right. Now I say, guard yourself for true. He leapt high to one side, then forward, pressing a furious attack. Paul fell back, parrying. He felt the field crackling as shield edges touched and repelled each other, sensed the electric tingling of the contact along his skin. What's gotten into Gurney? he asked himself. He's not faking this. Paul moved his left hand, dropped his bodkin into his palm from its wrist sheath. You see a need for an extra blade, eh? Halleck grunted. Is this betrayal? Paul wondered. Surely not Gurney. Around the room they fought, thrust and parry, faint and counterfeit. The air within the shield bubbles grew stale from the demands on it that the slow interchange along the barrier edges could not replenish. With each new shield contact, the smell of ozone grew stronger. Paul continued to back, but now he directed his retreat towards the exercise table. If I can turn him beside the table, I'll show him a trick, Paul thought. One more step, Gurney. Halleck took that step. Paul directed a parry downward, turned and saw Halleck's rapier catch against the table's edge. Paul flung himself aside, thrust high with rapier, and came in across Halleck's neckline with the bodkin. He stopped the blade an inch from the jugular. "'Is this what you seek?' Paul whispered. "'Look down, lad,' Gurney panted. Paul obeyed, saw Halleck's kinjal thrust under the table's edge the tip almost touching Paul's groin. "'We'd have joined each other in death,' Alex said. "'But I'll admit, you fought some better when pressed to it. You seem to get the mood.' And he grinned wolfishly, the ink vine scar rippling along his jaw. "'The way you came at me,' Paul said. "'Would you really have drawn my blood?' Alec withdrew the kinjal, straightened. "'If you'd fought one whit beneath your abilities,' I'd have scratched you a good one, a scar you'd remember. I'll not have my favorite pupil fall to the first Harkonnen tramp who happens along. Paul deactivated his shield, leaned on the table to catch his breath. I deserved that, Gurney, but it would have angered my father if you'd hurt me. I'll not have you punished for my failing. As to that, Alex said, it was my failing too, and you needn't worry about the training scar or two. You're lucky you have so few. As to your father, but you could punish me only if I failed to make a first-class fighting man out of you, and I'd have been failing there if I hadn't explained a fallacy in this mood thing you've suddenly developed. Paul straightened, slipped his bodkin back into its wrist sheath. It's not exactly play we do here, Alex said. Paul nodded. He felt a sense of wonder at the uncharacteristic seriousness in Alex's manner, the sobering intensity. He looked at the beet-coloured ink-vine scar on the man's jaw, remembering the story of how it had been put there by the beast Raban in a Harkonnen slave pit on Gidi Prime, and Paul felt a sudden shame that he had doubted Halleck even for an instant. It occurred to Paul, then, that the making of Halleck's scar had been accompanied by pain, a pain as intense, perhaps, as that inflicted by a reverend mother. He thrust this thought aside. It chilled their world. I guess I did hope for some play today, Paul said. Things are so serious around here lately. Alec turned away to hide his emotions. Something burned in his eyes. There was a pain in him, like a blister. All that was left of some lost yesterday that time had pruned off him. How soon this child must assume his manhood, Alec thought. How soon he must read that form within his mind that contract of brutal caution, to enter the necessary fact on the necessary line. Please list your next of kin. Halleck spoke without turning. I sensed the play in you, lad, and I'd like nothing better than to join in it, but this no longer can be play. Tomorrow we go to Arrakis. Arrakis is real. The Harkonnens are real. Paul touched his forehead with the rapier blade held vertical. Halleck turned, saw the salute, and acknowledged it with a nod. He gestured to the practice dummy. Now, we'll work on your timing. Let me see you catch that thing sinister. I'll control it from over there where I can have a full view of the action. 
And I warn you, I'll be trying new counters today. There's a warning you'd not get from a real enemy. Paul stretched up on his toes to relieve his muscles. He felt solemn with the sudden realization that his life had become filled with swift changes. He crossed to the dummy, slapped the switch on its chest with a rapier tip, and felt the defensive field forcing his blade away. On guard, Halleck said, and the dummy pressed the attack. Paul activated his shield, parried and countered. Halleck watched as he manipulated the controls. His mind seemed to be in two parts, one alert to the needs of the training fight, the other wandering in a fly buzz. I'm the well-trained fruit tree, he thought, full of well-trained feelings and abilities, and all of them grafted onto me, all bearing for someone else to pick. For some reason, he recalled his younger sister, her elfin face so clear in his mind. But she was dead now, in a pleasure house for Harkonnen troops. She had loved pansies. Or was it daisies? He couldn't remember. It bothered him that he couldn't remember. Paul countered a slow swing of the dummy, brought up his left hand on Tretis. That clever little devil, Halleck thought, intent now on Paul's interweaving hand motions. He's been practicing and studying on his own. That's not Duncan's style, and it's certainly nothing I've taught him. This thought only added to Halleck's sadness. I'm infected by mood, he thought, and he began to wonder about Paul, if the boy ever listened fearfully to his pillow throbbing in the night. If wishes were fishes, we'd all cast nets, he murmured. It was his mother's expression, and he always used it when he felt the blackness of tomorrow on him. Then he thought, what an odd expression that was, to be taken to a planet that had never known seas or fishes. And that's the end of chapter 4. Welcome to chapter 5 of Dune. UA Wellington Standard 10,082.10-191 Medical Doctor of the Sook School Graduated Standard 10,112 Married Juana Marcus Benny Jesuit Standard 10,092.10-186 Chiefly noted as betrayer of Duke Leto Atreides See further Bibliography Appendix 7 Imperial Conditioning and Betrayal The from the Dictionary of Muad'Dib by the Princess Irulan. Although he heard Dr. Yue entering the training room, noting the stiff deliberation of a man's pace, Paul remained stretched out face down on the exercise table where the masseuse had left him. He felt deliciously relaxed after the workout with Gurney Halleck. You do look comfortable, said Yue in his calm, high-pitched voice. Paul raised his head, saw the man's stick figure standing several paces away, and took in at a glance the wrinkled black clothing, the square block of a head with purple lips and drooping moustache, the diamond tattoo of imperial conditioning on his forehead, the long black hair caught in the Sook School's silver ring at his left shoulder. "'You'll be happy to hear we haven't time for regular lessons today,' Yue said. Your father will be along presently. Paul sat up. However, I've arranged for you to have a film book viewer and several lessons during the crossing to Arrakis. Oh. Paul began pulling on his clothes. He felt excitement that his father would be coming. They had spent so little time together since the Emperor's command to take over the fife of Arrakis. Yue crossed to the L table, thinking... How oh, the boy has filled out these past few months. Such a waste. Oh, such a sad waste. And then he reminded himself, I must not falter. What I do is done to be certain my Wana can no longer be hurt by the Harkonnen beasts. Paul joined him at the table, fastening his jacket. What'll I be studying on the way across? Oh, the tyrannic life forms of Arrakis. The planet seems to have opened its arms to certain tyrannic life forms. It's not clear how. I must seek out the planetary ecologist when we arrive, uh, Dr. Kynes, and offer my help in the investigation. 
and Yue thought, What am I saying? I play the hypocrite even with myself. Will there be something on the Fremen? Paul asked. The Fremen? Yue drummed his fingers on the table, caught Paul staring at the nervous motion, withdrew his hand. Maybe you've something on the whole Arakeen population, Paul said. Yes, to be sure, Yue said. There are two general separations of the people. Fremen, they are one group, and the others are the people of the Graben, the Sink, and the Pan. There's some intermarriage, I'm told. The women of the Pan and Sink villages prefer Fremen husbands, and their men prefer Fremen wives. They have a saying, Polish comes from the cities, wisdom from the desert. Do you have pictures of them? I'll see what I can get you. The most interesting feature, of course, is their eyes. Totally blue, no whites in them. Mutation? No, it's linked to saturation of the blood with melange. The Fremen must be brave to live at the edge of the desert. By all accounts, Yue said, they compose poems to their knives. Their women are as fierce as men, and even Fremen children are violent and dangerous. You'll not be permitted to mingle with them, I dare say. Paul stared at Yue, finding in these few glimpses of the Fremen a power of words that caught his entire attention. What a people to win as allies! And the worms? Paul asked. What? I'd like to study more about the sandworms. Ah, to be sure. I have a film book on a small specimen, only 110 meters long and 22 meters in diameter. It was taken in the northern latitudes. Worms of more than 400 meters in length have been recorded by reliable witnesses, and there's reason to believe even larger ones exist. Paul glanced down at the conical projection chart on the northern Arakeen latitudes spread on the table. The desert belt and south polar regions are marked uninhabitable. Is it the worms? And the storms? But any place can be made habitable. If it's economically feasible, Yue said, Arrakis has many costly perils. He smoothed his drooping moustache. Your father will be here soon. Before I go, I have a gift for you. Something I came across in packing. He put an object on the table between them. Black, oblong, no larger than the end of Paul's thumb. Paul looked at it. Yue noted how the boy did not reach for it and thought, How cautious he is. It's a very old orange Catholic Bible made for space travellers. Not a film book, but actually printed on filament paper. It has its own magnifier and electrostatic charge system. He picked it up, demonstrated. The book is held closed by the charge, which forces against the spring-locked covers. You press the edge, thus, and the pages you've selected repel each other, and the book opens. It's so small. But it has 1,800 pages. You press the edge, thus, and so and the charge moves ahead one page at a time as you read. Never touch the actual pages with your fingers. The filament tissue is too delicate. He closed the book, handed it to Paul. Try it. Yue watched Paul work the page adjustment, thought, I salve my own conscience. I give him the surcrease of religion before betraying him. Thus may I say to myself that he has gone where I cannot go. This must have been made before film books, Paul said. It's quite old. Let it be our secret, eh? Your parents might think it too valuable for one so young. And Yue thought, his mother would surely wonder at my motives. Well, Paul closed the book, held it in his hand. If it's so valuable... Indulge an old man's whim, Yue said. It was given to me when I was very young. And he thought... I must catch his mind as well as his cupidity. Open it to 467, Kalima, where it says, From water does all life begin. There's a slight notch at the edge of the cover to mark the place. Paul felt the cover, detected two notches, one shallower than the other. He pressed the shallower one, and the book spread open on his palm, its magnifier sliding into place. Read it aloud, 
Yue said. Paul wet his lips. With his tongue read, Think you of a fact that a deaf person cannot hear? Then, what deafness may we not all possess? What senses do we lack that we cannot see and cannot hear another world all around us? What is there around us that we cannot- Stop it! Yue barked. Paul broke off, stared at him. Yue closed his eyes, fought to regain composure. What perversity caused the book to open at my Wana's favorite passage? He opened his eyes, saw Paul staring at him. Is something wrong? Paul asked. I'm sorry, Yue said. That was my dead wife's favorite passage. It's not the one I intended you to read. It brings up memories that are painful. There are two notches, Paul said. Of course, Yue thought. Wana marked her favorite passage. His fingers are more sensitive than mine, and found her mark. It was an accident, no more. You may find the book interesting, Yue said. It has much historical truth in it, as well as a good ethical philosophy. Paul looked down at the tiny book in his palm. Such a small thing, yet it contained a mystery. Something bad had happened whilst he read from it. He had felt something stir his terrible purpose. Your father will be here any minute, Yue said. Put the book away and read it at your leisure. Paul touched the edge of it as Yue had shown him. The book sealed itself. He slipped it into his tunic. For a moment there, when Yue had barked at him, Paul had feared the man would demand the book's return. I thank you for the gift, Dr. Yue, Paul said, speaking formally. It will be our secret. If there is a gift or favor you wish from me, please do not hesitate to ask. I need for nothing, Yue said, and he thought. Why do I stand here torturing myself and torturing this poor lad? Though he does not yet know it. Oh, yea, damn those Harkonnen beasts. Why did they choose me for their abomination? And so ends chapter five. Thank you very much as ever, guys. See you for some more in the future. Take care.